expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Good evening, everyone. You're tuned in to Apex Express on KPFA, bringing you an Asian and Asian American view from the Bay and around the world. This is Tracy Nguyen and Miko Lee tonight. We'll be talking with members of our Acre Network, which stands for Asian Americans for Civil Rights and Equality. Tonight, we'll be talking about Asian solidarity during this week's uprising against police brutality. Welcome to Apex Express. Tonight, we're featuring organizations from Acre, Asian Americans for Civil Rights and Equality, a network of 11 Asian American activist groups fighting for social justice. Acre includes organizations like us, Apex Express, and our partners tonight, including Asian Prisoner Support Committee, Hmong Innovating Politics, Network on Religion and Justice, and Alliance of South Asians Taking Action. Welcome. Thank you all for joining us on Apex Express. We are recording this on Tuesday, June 2nd for an airing on Thursday, June 4th. We wouldn't normally say this, but we're not in normal times and the world is changing so fast. We just wanted to make sure to mention this. So this has been a really hard few months and an even harder week. And we have watched or read about the violent deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Tyler, Ahmaud Arbery, Tony McDade, and David McAtee, and countless others at the hands of police officers. They represent just five of the 1,000 people that's killed by police every year, according to the Mapping Police Violence Project. American police killed three people per day in 2019. So around the U.S. and actually around the world, there have been massive protests against police brutality. So tonight, we're joining our Acre colleagues to discuss how we as Asian Americans stand in solidarity with Black Lives Matter and to also recognize the anti-Black racism within our own communities. So joining me and Tracy tonight are Nate Tan from Asian Prisoner Support Committee, Fatima Zira Lada from the Alliance for Southeast Asians Taking Action, Miku Viu from Hmong Innovating Politics, and Bianca Mabuti Louis from Network on Religion and Justice. Welcome to all of you. So each of you come from organizations that are committed to social justice and uplifting the API and other marginalized communities. But we also know that not all API folks fall into this category. And we also know that two of the four police officers at the scene of the murder um, in Minnesota were Asian American. So one of those officers had six complaints against him. And the other officer that actually committed the murder was married to an Asian woman. So my first question is, what did each of you feel like when you saw those images of Officer Tao? Uh, this is Nate with APSC. Uh, when I saw those images with Officer Tao, I don't think it came to a surprise for me. I think doing this work, incarceration and trying to decarcerate, um, I think Asian Prisoner Support Committee understands intimately that those who are recruited to be police, to be correctional officers, to be in the military, to be in any sort of enforcement agency comes from low-income neighborhoods. That's where they do the recruiting. Um, so I think in that regard, it didn't come off as a surprise. I think um, what my initial reaction was is is how, how is the Southeast Asian community going to respond to um, this officer who is Hmong, um, who is complicit in the death of George Floyd? Um, how is their response going to be? How are they going to be in coalition and solidarity um, with Black Lives Matter? How are they, you know, what, is, what does this mean for our community? And I don't think this is new to our community. I think our community um, has had representatives um, who are Vietnamese Hmong 
or Cambodian be in law enforcement and, and kind of perpetuate the violence of uh, what the police um, state brings. Nate, thanks for that. Does anybody else have um, input to give on this topic about what it felt like when they saw that this police officer was Asian American? And to kind of contextualize it with how the police have had such an impact in the API community. Yeah, hi, this is Mike Huvu, uh, she, her pronouns, uh, also from Hmong Innovating Politics. So right there, um, <laughs> with Tu Tao being Hmong, it definitely, um, like Nate was saying, actually isn't surprising because Minnesota is home to one of the largest Hmong population in the U.S. Um, and especially in the Minneapolis and St. Paul area as well. And so seeing Tu on that photo, um, I think my initial response, well, for a lot of people, their initial responses was Tu Tao doesn't represent the Hmong community. Um, but for me and a lot of other uh, Hmong women in, in the Hmong community, I think for us, we do see that Tu Tao does represent um, a, a good chunk of the Hmong community. Um, and that's because, in a sense, he does represent our uncles, our brothers, our cousins, who are um, who have shown their anti-Blackness over time, which is something that isn't just what Hmong folks do, but also the API community as a whole. Um, and a lot of that stems from white supremacy and that whole model minority myth where they have over time pitted us against each other. Um, and especially with Tu Tao being from Minnesota, when the Hmong community first arrived here as refugees back in the 70s and the 80s, um, a lot of Hmong games were starting to develop because they were adopting a lot of the black game structures um, and also utilizing this as a self-defense mechanism. And so now you have um, these, these communities growing up um, pitted against each other um, in low-income neighborhoods and with them having to police one another. And for them, their outlet or their way of thinking is that, okay, um, so we see that this is what Black folks are doing. And then for them, their image of white folks are policemen, are the who is right, right? Um, and we get this from the media as well. And so now you have these um, very like patriarchal Hmong men who... Um, are starting to stick to this rhetoric. And so for me, seeing Tu Tao um, in that aspect wasn't a surprise. Um, I think what my coup brought up for me was um, not only are Asian American communities and specifically Southeast Asian communities anti-Black, I think um, when I think about it, the refugee resettlement program, I think a lot of people will say it's like a failed program. But I think to some various degree, it's a successful resettlement program in that it feels like the U.S. wanted to resettle us in cities where, um, you know, resources were pulled out of, where there's heavy policing. Um, and, you know, I always think about the t about what the guys inside San Quentin share is that when they moved into these neighborhoods, which are like Stockton, Minneapolis, Minneapolis Oakland, Long Beach, like these are predominantly black cities. Right. And these are also cities where uh, police officers have taken black lives. Um, and these are also cities where they grew up in, where they were bullied. Right. By the people in that community. So it's almost like um, a storm in which um, conflict is naturally going to arise. And I think it wasn't until much later on in my life that, you know, I had a framework to, to think about what what is anti-blackness in the Asian American community? How are we so... How is it so nuanced? Um, and how are we going to move to be in coalition after all this historic phenomena that has happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you just dropped a lot of important knowledge that I think a lot of our Southeast Asian families and Asian American families don't understand, right? These are, like you said, you don't 
learn about these things until you open up a textbook or go to a, um, go to college and um, enroll in Asian American studies. Um, I know Bianca um, on Instagram, since the beginning of COVID, she's done these incredible zines, very bite-sized, like political education in the form of eight pages with graphics and talk bubbles has, has been really effective. Um, and in terms of like the gap between the reality and the history of the U.S. and how our Asian American, our Asian Americans understand that the actual truth of that. that. What is what is that bridge like, Bianca? Like, I want to hear about your experience in creating the content and what you've been receiving from your audience. Thank you for asking that question. I think this is a really opportune moment where I'm seeing a lot of Asian Americans in my community who maybe have never, you know, critically thought about. Um, their complicity in anti-blackness, their positionality in racial structures in this country actually have a very sincere awakening right now. Um, and it's really beautiful to see, but we have to recognize that the cost of this awakening has been too high, right? But it has been the cost of black lives. And so I'm also at the same time wary to celebrate that. Um, in terms of what you're asking with political education, I think now is a really critical and opportune moment um, there's a temptation to just post and donate and kind of practice this performative solidarity that we're seeing. But what I think we as organizers and educators on this call, um, the call for us right now is really to take folks beyond the social media solidarity into a deeper lifelong commitment into the work. And I think a lot of that comes from um, with what Nate and who were talking about comes from understanding the political context and history um, that creates these conditions and um, really grounding us in the fact that, you know, resistance and solidarity actually have always been part of our histories and narratives. It's the model minority myth and white supremacy that assume that we're apolitical. Um, and that's a very dangerous narrative. And so in this moment, grounding us in the fact that, again, resistance and solidarity have always been part of our histories, that we can look to folks who um, are refugees, who have been incarcerated, who we can look to um, Native Hawaiian sovereignty movements, for example, we can look to folks within our community who have been marginalized by multiple systems to teach us what it looks like to organize as a community moving forward. Can you each speak a little bit about the model minority myth and how that's been utilized as a tool against API folks and how it's kind of conditional based on experience like right now with COVID-19 racism, it's clearly not a thing. So um, are you all open? Can you all talk a little bit about model minority myth? Hi, yeah, this is Fatima from the Alliance of South Asians Taking Action. Um, just, you know, as we know, many of us in the API community is also very diverse and, and, you know, we all belong to different ethnic and class backgrounds. But the model minority myth has been used often to um, justify by the state anti-blackness and um, also like the the heavy policing of black communities and and often um, you know our, our, our many Asian American communities and Pacific Islander communities have been pointed to as examples of how minorities can quote unquote thrive and and the state has used that to justify a lot of um, anti-black violence and so I think um, it really is in you know uh, incumbent upon us especially those of us who've who've not only um, you know been silent but have because of our silence actively contributed to anti-blackness to to fight these uh, tools of oppression like policing and and I actually just wanted to say one more thing I think you know, I agree that we have a lot of work to do within our communities around um, education, around policing and, and police violence. But um, I also think it's important to recognize the ways in which the state invests so many uh, financial resources into policing and how they use um, like how they use the vulnerabilities of poor communities of color to uh, pit people of color against each other. So when the state is stealing resources and 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 money from from uh, poor folks um, and is investing when the state invests uh, primarily in policing and uh, and 
the way that it does that is by stealing financial resources away from poor communities of color. We also have to fight. Um, we also have to fight the stealing of those resources if we're going to fight policing and if we're going to have true solidarity between communities of color and poor communities. Nate, you want to speak on the model minority myth? You know, when I think about the model minority myth, I think about how it's birthed to be a tool of anti-blackness. I think about how right after the civil rights movement, you know, the United States opened their immigration doors and said, come on in, prioritizing um, working professionals, tech professionals, mostly from uh, East Asia um, and, and South Asia. And it came at a time when, you know, after... 1965 immigration um, policy passed, you had this huge wave of um, high class, well-educated Asian Americans coming to the United States. And in the 80s and 90s, the United States was, um, yeah, you know, creating publications and in and, and the Times Magazine about the model minority myth. Um, at the same time, the United States was also cracking down on black communities as a response to the civil rights, right? Law and order, tough on crimes, huge overhaul of, um, of police departments with, with funding, just giving a bunch of funding. Uh, and it wasn't until shortly after, probably in the 80s and 90s, that like Southeast Asian Americans started to come to the United States as refugees. Uh, and they were kind of the antithesis of the model minority myth. Um, and they were moving into those cities um, that were highly impacted by police, highly impacted by incarceration, and because of their refugee status, highly uh, impacted by deportation after they served their time. Um, and when I think about the model minority myth, I think about how uh, it's, I, you know, I don't know if we've overdone its usefulness. I think it's useful to understand the historical context of Asian, American, Asian America and Asian Americans. Um, as because I think there's a lot of referencing to Yellow Peril and there's a lot of referencing to uh, these movements in the 60s. Um, and then the model minority myth comes in, you know, shortly after that and it kind of throws a curveball to Asian Americans coming into the United States. That's something, um, that's something that they we can use different minority groups to be a wedge between each other, to be in contact with each other. Thanks for that, Nate. Bianca, what do you, what's your take on the model minority status and how that's been used as a tool against API people? Yeah, well, I actually, I, you know, my colleagues on this call gave such a great um, history and the political context of how it's been used to really pit um, communities of color against each other. I wanted to speak on um, a lot of folks in my community. So, you know, just full disclaimer, my positionality, I am Chinese American. Uh, my parents were able to come. They weren't part of the educated and model minority class that were allowed to come. They were a little bit more working class, but a lot of folks in my community do feel like, you know, they have been able to achieve the American dream. So what is all this um, conversation and rioting, quote unquote, about? Um, and I think one thing we don't realize is that the mo quote unquote model minority myth or these myths of success as have come at a cost. They have not just been the products of quote unquote hard work. Um, they have come at the cost of anti-blackness, black and indigenous and brown labor, the theft of indigenous land, all of these things. And so that's why, again, what I said earlier, the work of political education in our own communities is so important in um, helping our folks situate their idea of success outside of an individualist framework, but actually in the context of um, community and seeing how, you know, there are invisible costs and deaths that have happened um, at the expense of, and that have allowed um, our so-called success in this country. And, and I'm speaking again, very specifically in a, a East Asian upwardly mobile context, because like my friends have shared, the model minority myth um, does not apply to a lot of Asians who do face very real systemic barriers in education, income, all of these things. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, there's so much information on the disaggregation of data and how that really does skew toward only one small portion of the Asian American community. But we could talk about that later. Right now, we're going to take a short music break and listen to Freedom by Cominas.
You're tuned into Apex Express on 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and K248BR in Santa Cruz, and always online at kpfa.org. So you just heard Freedom by Kuminas, and the Kuminas are a punk rock band formed in 2005 by two Pakistani Americans from Worcester, Mass. Asata used this song Freedom in their video, and we are back with Acre members from Asian Prisoner Support Committee, Hmong Innovating Politics, Network on Religion and Justice, and Alliance of South Asians Taking Action. So, y'all, the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans stated we cannot ask the black community to fight anti-Asian racism if we are not willing to fight for them. So can each of you address how the API community has benefited from the black-led social justice movement? So while you're thinking, I want to just point out, as you all know, that even internationally, Martin Luther King Jr. learned about nonviolence protests from Gandhi. And conversely, the Dalit Panthers were inspired by the Black Panthers. So we know that there's been this um, cross-cultural exchange around solidarity for many, many years. So I'd love you all just to touch a little bit on the API community and how we have benefited from the Black Civil Rights Movement. Hi, it's Waiku. Um, I can start us off with talking about the how APIs have benefited from the civil rights movement. And so um, for many of us, we wouldn't have the rights that we have right now if it weren't for those Black leaders um, that were leading the fight in the civil rights movement. Um, and back then, we had a lot of solidarity um, with a lot of different groups working towards that together. For Southeast Asian Americans, especially um, for the refugees that are here right now, uh, back then we had a legislative piece moved forward because the Black community pushed for the U.S. to take in the uh, Southeast Asian refugees from um, the Vietnam War, the Secret War, um, and the Khmer Rouge. And I also want to say that aside from just benefiting from the social justice aspect. Um, I think there is a lot of healing that also needs to be done in our community um, and a lot of education in that piece. A lot of our folks don't realize that the Black community has done so much um, to set the groundwork and to set the framework for us. And Maiku, because HIP does such amazing work with the Hmong folks in Sacramento and Fresno, two other major populations of Hmong refugees in America, what does that healing look like? How does that healing work look like for you all? I think for us, um, for Hmong folks and a lot of other Southeast Asians as well, because they didn't fall into the modern minority myth, um, they also went through similar experiences in the low income neighborhoods that uh, black folks also went through. And so there has been a lot of um, cultural insensitivity um, in the way that our community grew up in the school system. And then also uh, while also fighting the gang violence that was also in the neighborhoods as well. And so for a lot of them, because they didn't learn about um, how the Black community has helped uh, the rest of the communities. Um, for them, their vision of the Black community is just violence and gang violence. And for them, um, a lot of their experiences are valid. They grew up in these neighborhoods being pitted against each other. Um, but at the same time, um, I think for us, they need to be heard. These stories need to be heard and validated. I think oftentimes, um, especially during the Black Lives Matter movement, um, I'm seeing a lot of these people get shot down when they say um, that they're, this is what they experienced back in the 80s, this is what they experienced back in the 90s, and this is why they won't support Black Lives Matter. Um, and rather than just getting angry at them and um, yelling at them, I think we need to look at it from a different lens to try to um, first heal before we start educating as well. Thanks. Fatima, do you want to join in here? Hi, this is Fatima. Um, the South Asian community has learned a lot from Black organizers, and the Black community in the U.S. has been organizing for centuries now. And there, there are a lot of specific ways in which um, 
issues that impacted the black community have now also impacted South Asian and Muslim communities. For example, law enforcement, surveillance, and harassment. And a lot of tactics to organize against surveillance and law enforcement harassment have been learned um, from the black community. Um, We also have learned how to conduct sustainable organizing and community-based organizing and also have learned how we can... um, organize ourselves to advocate for our own our own civil rights protection. So I think there are a lot of core lessons we've learned from the black community. I think in a lot of ways we owe a lot of our our organi- organizing and and a lot of the ways in which we've kind of um, built you know certain uh, protections of our rights to the black community. And so I think as we move forward, uh, it's not just about like how do we show up as allies, but how do we um, remember that legacy of uh, you know we, every all the, so many of the rights that we have today and so many of the protections we have today are because the black community fought for them and and actually showed us how to how to fight for them as well. Um, this is Bianca. I can also add. Uh, so I'm speaking specifically from um, my experience organizing with Network on Religion and Justice. And so we mostly organize around queer affirmation and faith communities. Um, but specifically speaking to Asian American faith communities in this moment, I think this is a moment to really interrogate how religion and um, our churches, I work mostly in Christian contexts, um, how these things have been weaponized as a tool for white supremacy and even our own colonization. And so to answer your question about the civil rights movement, it was during then when the black church really modeled what it looks like to practice liberation theology and practice a spirituality that activates solidarity and justice for all of us. Um, and so I think Asian Americans and faith communities in unlearning the model minority myth, we do have to decolonize our theologies, but there are so many black civil rights leaders, black um, liberation the- theologians and queer black theologians who um, have already paved the way to teach us what it means to reckon with white supremacy in our faith spaces, in the most intimate spaces that actually really indoctrinate our people um, into being complicit with anti-blackness and white supremacy. And so, yeah, just to offer, I guess, a different angle um, from the context of spirituality. Uh, This is Nate with APSC. Um, I think the whole entire world has benefited from Black-led movements. Um, And I say that because movements for fair wages, movements for disability justice, queer liberation, decarceration, social benefits, voting, citizenship, um, and just human rights overall has been and continues to be led by Black folks. Um, And I I want to go back to Bianca's point on Asian American and Black solidarity um, being... It has existed in the past, and it still continues to exist now. And I think about how it may not visually exist um, in like the physical space, or it may not exist clearly in the social media world with um, kind of this uh, performative solidarity going on. But I think about how when working with people in prison and ICE, that the prison hunger strikers, the jail hunger strikers, the immigration detention hunger strikers are all people impacted by incarceration, which are, you know, predominantly black folks, Asian Americans, the Latinx community. And I think about how our Asian American brothers and sisters inside know that they aren't free until everyone in prison is free. And they learn that from um, their black counterparts in prison. And they learn that from their lineage to the uh, black freedom struggle. And, and more recently, I think about how Nia, Nia Noren, she's like one of my movement uh, heroes, and movement, freedom fighter, sisters, how she fought tooth and nail to get this Ethiopian woman out of uh, immigration detention, uh, Leah Baru, uh, and never let up and always fought. Uh, and it wasn't until last week, or it was last week that ne- uh, Leah got bail and Nia was the first one to greet her right at the immigration gates. And I think, you know, those are models of solidarity, uh, and, you know, learning from our movement past that get us to this um, this freedom stage, right? This, this freedom moment uh, in time. 
Thank you all so much for uplifting that history. You know, the civil rights movement was 40 years ago. And that, although that seems long, it actually wasn't that long. But it, from, from MLK days into to now, Black Lives Matter movement and the uprising we have during a pandemic, what what has you know Nate? You talked a little bit about it, but what have the, what has the Asian American movement been doing since we were seated from the inspiration of the Black Panthers and the Black Power movement since the Civil Rights Movement? We, you know that is where a lot of our nonprofits started 40, 50 years ago. What have we been? What's the narrative of the Asian American movement since then? What have we done in the prison systems? What, we, what have we done around um, anti police brutality? Um, within our own communities, building uh, civic engagement. Please share more about what um, your communities have been working on. Hi, this is Fatima. Um, so the ASATA and actually a bunch of different organizations in the Bay Area have working have been working on law enforcement uh, law enforcement harassment issues for for a while now. Law enforcement has harassed. Uh, communities of colors for centuries and um, specifically in the Bay Area um, we've been looking uh, at how to get FBI out of uh, the Bay Area and um, to end partnerships between the FBI and local police. This is because we know that the FBI has a history of targeting um, our communities and black communities, native communities, undocumented communities in the Bay Area. And so something we've been working on specifically is um, to end the relationship between FBI and local law enforcement um, in this partnership called the Joint Terrorism Task Force, which, an, which is an FBI program that takes local law enforcement and cross-deputizes them as FBI agents. And this is really harmful because uh, it, locally we, you know, California and in Oakland, we ha we're supposed to have more protections over our civil rights, but the FBI doesn't. Um, but the FBI doesn't actually uh, adhere to those local rules, and so Asata and a bunch of different organizations have been working on that. And it's pressing now because AG Barr on Sunday basically called on all the JTTS around the country to um, investigate protesters under domestic terrorism. So we know that there's going to be increased surveillance and um, criminalizing of f f first and foremost black organizers, but um, the other protesters as well. And so, um, you know, th that's one concrete way we've been trying to fight the impact of uh, law enforcement harassment and FBI harassment specifically. And that's, you know, coming from a legacy of a decades long fight against law enforcement. Thank you. I think when Fatima was talking and what your question brings up for me is, um, you know, I got into organizing and this movement work um, because of uh, a lot of the black political prisoners that I was reading about in school. And I wrote um, to Mumia Jamal uh, back in the day. And I think about um, what solidarity means. And I think solidarity can this day and age feel like a really empty term. And uh, when I think about how I want to show solidarity, give solidarity or receive solidarity, I think of it um, kind of in, in a similar way. I think about love, right? Like it's uh, how deep you build the relationships with someone, not how, um, it's the depth of the relationship, not the width. Uh, that could probably be framed a lot better. But, um, you know, and, and writing Mumi and Jamal really got me um, into uh, the, this prison work. Um, and, and for APSC, I think it's, uh, it, it was really clear that APSC was going to work uh, to free them all. Uh, and our main targets were going to be structures that impact the Asian American community, but also impact other communities of color and especially um, these structures that impact predominantly black community members. So these are, this is prison, this is jail, this is ICE, this is police. Um, and I think about how our, our legacy comes from um, the people who came before us, which are Asian American women uh, in the movement, Yuri Kochiyama, Grace Lee Boggs, um, who continue to show us how to build these deep relationships that bring about freedom and how to sustain yourself in this work so we can get there together at some point. Nate, thank you for that. On that note, we're going to take a short break and listen to the Blue Scholar's Ode to Yuri Kochiyama. Even if them K 
kids cop the shirts and stop wearing them. Humbled in the presence of the veterans and not the ones who picked up their guns, but who picked up their brethren and sister in. History in the making, I was witnessing, listening. Seen this old Japanese lady with the sticker on a rocker said, Free Mumia and this was before the trust of variants were saying it. Taking it for granted that we talk about the 60s and never get to talk to anybody who done lived the shit and still exists. Or better yet, she, she still resists. Speaking to a myriad of young, dumb, and ignorant kids. I was one of them. Stuck around lingering. Said that it's a privilege to meet you in person. And she took my hand, said it's good to meet you too. And when I'm out of school, ask me what I'm gonna do. I had to think about it, but truth is I knew that it was something for the youth and shit. Truly, I'd probably be a teacher if the music didn't make enough to make me want to gamble on its sustenance. And that's why I'm writing this to tell y'all from a scholar. When I grow up, I wanna be just like you. Sweat of my Kasamas When I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kochiyama If she ever hear this, it's an honor Cause when I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kochiyama Serve the people proper And when I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kochiyama Up in Life magazine, you were sitting front seat from Malcolm's last speech. Saw the first man with the shotgun. Two more came to get the job done. Now who would have thought that it'd be you holding him? I wonder what you felt when his eyes were going dim. And if he never died, would we know that he exists? Or would he been the leader that we always seem to miss? Now there's no taking back whatever happens in our midst. You remind me that it's more than just a martyr in a myth. You could have said it quits many times ever since. And you find there will always be a reason for the fist. The last one to hold them could have been somebody else. And you still be remembered for the people that you helped. They said it keeps trying, but never. Losing hope, revolutionaries die, but the revolution don't, and it won't, and I put that on my mama. Cause when I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kochiyama. Holla, swear to my Kasamas. When I grow up, I wanna be just like Yuri Kochiyama. And if she ever hear this, it's an honor. Cause when I grow up, I wanna be just like. We are back on Apex Express, and you just heard the Blue Scholar song, Yuri Kochiyama. And as Yuri said, what should Asian Americans be doing today? They should be fighting against racism, injustices, inequities. And she also reminds us to transform yourself first. Keep expanding your horizon, decolonize your mind and cross borders. So with that in mind, tonight we're talking with our Acre thought leaders about what we are doing to transform our communities. So I'd love each of you to let us know what's happening in your organization, your community around API Black Solidarity and what we should be doing. Um, I think right now, because a lot of us are, are organizing from home, um, it's definitely a bit different than what we would like to do. Um, and for HIP, we've been kind of transitioning with a lot of, um, with our leadership structure and then also um, with the work that we're doing with all the different things that have been coming up, you know, transitioning with COVID-19, um, having to support the work on the um anti-API hate from, um, from the past couple of months as well. And then now we're transitioning to um, support Black Lives Matter in whatever way we can. Um, as an organization, we've been having a lot of discussions on this. Um, as a community, there has been discussions um, and a lot of education that are coming from other um, leaders as well from Minnesota and Wisconsin, especially, um, because HIP is still fairly new in California or just in general. Um, there's another organization called Freedom Inc. Um, over in Wisconsin that has been doing organizing work for the past 20 years and they're doing amazing um, solidarity work over there for the past 20 years as well. Um, and so they were the first ones to kind of jump onto this and to really um, push the agenda forward on social media um, to have these talks and to um, engage with the community through social media since we know that that's where our community is at right now. And just also once again, like I was saying earlier about um, 
you know, with APIs and the anti-blackness and where the community is at, and we have to meet them where they're at. Um, so we understand that we can't just mobilize overnight, but that we have to have these conversations and have to have these hard conversations and talking about what liberation looks like, what um, solidarity looks like, and um, why we have to focus on the bigger picture and the um the systematic changes that need to be done and the police brutality that is also there that we know has affected our community in the past um, and to look past, not look completely past, but like just to, you know, because we know that this isn't a transactional um, um, uh, relationship that we have with um other groups um, of other communities as well, but to think of it as a transformative space and to look past like that moment, the past few months of having that API, API hate. Um, I think a lot of our community is hurt for the past couple of months. Also seeing that um, like every time they open up their social media, they would see that the hate was the hate crimes were coming from um, the black community as well. But we have to remind them that that doesn't, represent their community, that those are individual motions that are happening and that's not a, um, a systemic problem that's rooted in the institutions as well. Um, and if it is, then that's also the cause of a bigger problem that we need to fix. Um, and so for now, we are just asking people to um, let go of those and to come together to uh, fight along with our Black brothers and sisters for Black liberation so that we can all also achieve liberation. Thank you for that. Uh, Bianca, you want to give us an update? I, you use social media in such a powerful way, and I'd love it if you could talk about ways that other folks can actually get involved in solidarity movement as well. Sure. Um, I think I'll talk about my organization first. Um, I think, so for NRJ, we are meeting weekly during this time to just kind of deepen our solidarity as individuals and as a community. Um, so we're meeting every Wednesday on Zoom. If anyone wants to join, you're welcome. Um, this Wednesday, we are talking specifically about anti-Blackness in our communities. Um, we're looking to actually connect and ask about some of our members to share their experiences, actually organizing um, against martial law in the Philippines and connect that to what it looks like to organize right now because of the curfews and basically we are in a situation of martial law right now. Um, with me personally, yeah, I do love to use, so, uh, oh yeah. All right, in your membership, can, can you share who's invited into your organization? Can anyone? Yeah, yeah good question, sorry. Uh, so NRJ is a uh, space for API, LGBTQ, people of faith and allies. Um, and so you don't have to identify with all or actually any of those intersections to join. We just ask that you respect and recognize that the space is centered for those intersections. So you can be queer and API and have nothing to do with um, a faith community and you're still welcome. That's awesome. um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think like for me personally, I think it's easy for, for folks who maybe have been doing this work for a long time to feel um, maybe impatient with people who maybe are just starting the conversation or just exploring their racial identities and privilege. Um, so for me personally, I'm really trying to practice, I think, patience and community and inclusion with that. Um, so I've been trying to use social media to basically turn my Asian American Studies syllabus online and just create resources um, for people in my community who are just beginning but who, who earnestly want to learn more. Um, so I'm just trying to create, I guess, pathways into deeper allyship and um, resistance for them. Bianca, thank you for that. Speaking of Asian American studies, Nate, can you talk about the work that you do in ethnic studies in San Quentin and the impact that has on cross-cultural solidarity? Yeah, so in San Quentin, uh, APSC, uh, myself and a group of other volunteers, we go in to co-facilitate an Asian American studies class and an ethnic studies class every Monday. Uh, and prior to covid I mean, the space was a super transformative space. Uh, it wasn't exclusive to Asian American or Pacific Islander prisoners. So we had um, uh, a wide variety of people from, from the yard uh, come and participate. Um, and it's been truly amazing to see what happens when you share this information about solidarity, movement history, movement struggle, liberation to people um, 
who've been fighting it day in and day out their whole lives or a good portion of their lives since they've been locked up. Um, and what we've seen is, you know, this um, cross uh, collaboration uh, of people fighting for each other's freedoms. Um, uh, people in prison uh, trying to work and advocate to end the transfer of people with immigration holds from prison to ICE. Uh, and that's across the board. We've had um, people come to each other after a class and say, hey, like, I didn't know this is what your family went through um, in history. And just to hear that uh, experience makes me uh, reflective on my my life and my neighborhood growing up. And then there's that relationship that gets started and gets built. Um, and I think to speak to what APSC uh, is doing largely right now, since Roots has been on hold because of COVID-19, uh, um, I just have to dig through my list. What is APSC not doing? Uh, our, so our reentry support team uh, has been providing phenomenal peer support for people coming home out of prison and jails and ICE um, and preparing them for this, this new world, this COVID world with um, some PPE. We're launching a, uh, because Roots is on hold, um, we're trying to do some correspondence routes and we're launching this book program to women's prisons in California. Uh, we're getting people out of ICE through our Flatten ICE campaign that's been running for 11 weeks. And in 11 weeks, we've gotten 11 people out, uh, which includes Leah Baru, uh, Baru um, a domestic violence survivor, Ethiopian immigrant, um, wow. also Charles Joseph, uh, and all thanks to uh, uh, our directly impacted leadership uh, that has been leading that charge. Um, we're trying, always trying to end the transfer of immigrants and refugees from prison to ICE um, and have created some headway in, in the social media world. Like People are becoming more knowledgeable about that. And I think more importantly, uh, and my favorite thing that APSC is doing is we're pacing uh, and resting and sustaining ourselves and our work because this work can go on forever. And I think it's easy to get caught up in uh, the trend of what's happening in the world, but also know that our work is ongoing and will be ongoing past um, all the noise. And, you know, when we have the chance to be in solidarity, we will, but we know that we have to keep going for our people inside, um, our people on the streets and, and our families and our loved ones. Okay. Nate, that's really beautiful. Can you also just talk about how other folks can get involved in the work in the work of APSC, whether that's the um, online kind of call to actions or the donating or whatever, so that the audience can have something active that they can do? Yeah. Uh, every Tuesday, we are trying to flatten ice, hashtag flatten ice, hashtag flatten the curve and get people out of ice. We call our elected officials. We call ICE offices to let people out. And this is everyone. It's not specific to Asian Americans or Pacific Islanders. Um, and has been successful just to put pressure on uh, ICE and our government to say, hey, our communities are not safe before COVID and they're definitely not safe after COVID. And we love them and we'll take care of them. Uh, so let them out. Um, so they can do that by participating on online through searching up our hashtag. Uh, we have a toolkit. And also through that toolkit that you find online, have the numbers that you all can call. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's one way. Another way is we are also trying to bring back people who've been deported, uh, to Cambodia through our right to reunite campaign. People can get involved, uh, by searching up hashtag, right. The number two reunite. Uh, we've had this, uh, amazing fundraiser, um, with, um, some big performers like Ruby Barra and, and one, uh, Vaughn, the Cambodian artist from Philly. Um, and we want to, you know, our work is international, it's transnational. We want to make sure that we're taking care of our people here and taking care of our people, um, uh, overseas because, um, borders, seas, they can't keep us from being there for each other. Thank you so much for that. Fatima, can you talk about the work that Asata is doing around solidarity and how our audience can get involved? Yeah. Um, so this is Fatima. Asata has been doing a lot of work on uh, uh, law enforcement uh, accountability, but also um, kind of, uh, you know, protecting communities of color and defending communities of color from law enforcement. Um, and that comes through a number of campaigns that Asata has worked on, including the Stop Urban Shield campaign and more recently the 
the Joint Terrorism Task Force campaign in Oakland. Um, currently, we are working to end the relationship between uh, Oakland police and the FBI and the JTTF. And uh, you can get involved by getting on Asata's website and contacting us. Um, and uh, we have also been working internally to uh, look, really look at how um, many of our members uh, have, you know, caste and class privilege, and so how we can um, use those privileges, uh, redistribute resources, and um, kind of educate our community to put. Um, uh, c communities, uh, poor communities, black communities, native communities uh, ahead before private property. Uh, and um, we've also been doing, uh, aside from that, we've also been doing um, a lot of education uh, against war. We've also been examining uh, the, w the parallels between uh, how black communities are treated in the U.S. and violently um, and are accused of domestic terrorism and uh, U.S. wars abroad. And so um, there, you know, we've been working on a lot, of, a lot of international solidarity as well. All right. So right now, um, HIP is actually working on a lot of um, the census work and civic engagement um, because that's kind of how we started off with doing civic engagement work. Um, but at the same time, we also understand over time that we have to shift our gears a lot depending on um, the current movements and the bigger picture. And so I am actually working on youth organizing and um, organizing young adults and campus organizing right now. Um, so a lot of my work has transitioned into that over the, over the past uh, year. And um, so the reason for that focus is just to make sure that our youth and our young adults are getting the education they need um, in regards to the social justice movement, the civil rights movement, solidarity work, um, and everything that we're all trying to push for. Uh, this is Fatima. I just wanted to update everyone. As we know, on Sunday, Attorney General Barr uh, called on all the Joint Terrorism Task Force, all 56 around the country, to start uh, becoming more active and investigate the protesters, especially the Black protesters under domestic terrorism. Um, so we, ju I just wanted to quickly mention some resources in the Bay Area um, that offer free legal services. There's the Council on American Islamic Relations and the Asian Law Caucus. Both organizations are in the Bay and they offer free legal representation um, for anyone impacted by uh, law enforcement harassment and especially JTTF harassment. Um, and also both of those websites have um, know your rights information when impacted by the joint terrorism, when facing uh, joint terrorism task force harassment. And I would encourage everyone to just go in and um, read, you know, some of those resources. So we're all kind of a little bit more prepared of what's to come. Asian Americans and viewers out there, I know so many of us are eager to do something and stand up in solidarity for black lives. So here's a list of things you can consider doing today in your community, your neighborhood, or your in your very own home. They are learn to recognize and understand your own privilege and examine your biases. Validate the experiences and feelings of black lives and black people in your life. Avoid racist language and call it out when you see it or hear it. And they can come in the form of microaggressions, stereotyping, or derogatory language. Vocalize your support for the black community and share their stories. Be an active bystander. Educate yourself and others about colorism which is discrimination based on skin color. Support the Black Lives Matter movement, pro-black progress, black organizations, and black businesses. Get involved in your company or school's work or local campaigns to expand opportunities for black lives. Avoid appropriating black culture. Consider the music you listen to, the language you use, the fashion you wear, and even the art you enjoy. Have an open and honest discussion with children, family members, or others about racism. Read books or articles on racial inequality, social injustice, and history of anti-black racism, especially in our country. 
Reach out to local, county, state, and government representatives to voice your concerns and demands for victims of police violence and anti-black racism. Find a local protest in your city and protect black people and black businesses who are at risk of being harmed by the police and hostile individuals during these protests. Thank you so much to our guests from Acre for joining us tonight and offering their perspectives on Asian and Pacific Islander Black Solidarity. Stay safe out there. to find out more about Acre and the organizations we talked about. We thank the members from Asata, HIP, APSC, and NRJ for being with us on Apex Express. And all you listeners out there, keep resisting, keep organizing, keep creating and sharing your visions with the world. Your voices are important. Apex Express is produced by Tracy Nguyen, Preeti Mangala Shikar, Tara Durabji, Jessica Antonio, Nico Lee and Jelani Kalani Lee. Tonight's show was produced by your hosts, Tracy Nguyen and Nico Lee. Thanks to the crew at KPFA for their support during this shelter in place. Ibram X. Kendi. In order to truly create In anti-racist America, in anti-racist America and even world, where racial inequality does not exist, and racial inequality does not exist because racial discrimination doesn't exist, the only way to create that is for anti-racists to be in power. But but not only for anti-racists to be in power, we need anti-racist policies to be the law of the land. But we don't just need anti-racist policies to be the law of the land, we need anti-racist ideas of racial equality to be the common sense of the people. And we don't just need anti-racist ideas to be the common sense of the people, we need that anti-racist common sense of the people to hold those leaders and those policies accountable. Advancing the conversation to abolish racism for over 70 years, 94.1 KPFA. In the next 70 70 years, years. years. the people will rise up and the gun lobby will collapse. No-nonsense gun legislation will take hold and school shootings, suicide, domestic violence, and murder rates will evaporate. More common sense and less need for thoughts and prayers. In the next 70 years, your fiercely independent radio station will be here to cover it for you. you. 94.1 FM, KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org. Good evening.